Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar held by World Cement on behalf of Promacon. My name is David Bisley, I'm the editor of World Cement and I'll be your host today. In today's webinar, Hans-Georg Konrads, CEO of Promacon, will explore the advantages of a digital gas flow measurement system. In addition to explaining the measurement principle in detail, Hans will explain how the system can be deployed at various points across the cement production process, including the downcomer, raw mill, clinker cooler, bypass duct, tertiary air duct, and even the finished product mill. Additionally, Hans will also uh, highlight references and case studies from various sites. Now, before we begin today's presentation, I'd just like to remind you all that we are, of course, going to be holding a live Q&A session later on. So please do join in with any questions you might have. This is, as always, a great opportunity to get real-time insight into your questions from an industry expert. Submitting a question is also really super easy. For those of you uh, joining us via a desktop or laptop, please look to the top right of your screen and you should see a icon with a question mark in it there. To ask a question, simply click the icon and a box will pop out ready for you to type in your question and click send. Similarly, if you're joining us on a mobile device or cell phone, again, at the top right of your screen, you'll see an icon with a question mark. Tapping on this will take you through to the chat tab. Please then select the questions tab, type your question in and then press send. Okay, that's all from me for now. Hans, over to you, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, I welcome you all to this webinar. I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you today about measurement technology for cement making plants. When we talk about cement making, we talk about energy. And um, in the future, we'll also be talking about CO2 capture. So there's a lot of things going on in the cement plant that are, that are connected to gas flows, to heat flows, to energy uh, recuperation, and they all have to do with the flow of gas. A uh, cement plant is a place where there's a lot of gas flowing back and forth at various temperatures. And I would like to say that the cement plants that I've seen in my life, and I've seen a lot, do not have a lot of gas flow measurement because it's so hard to measure. Measuring gas flow in a cement plant is a very difficult task, even though it's one of the most fundamental things that you need to know when you're making cement in order to optimize your process. So let me first introduce my company, Promicon. Many in the cement world might know us. Um, we have retrofitted over 300 plants worldwide with our technology. So we have hundreds and hundreds of references. In each plant, we have several. So what is Promicon? Who are Promicon? We are located here in Germany, not too far away from Berlin in the beautiful city of Magdeburg. And our company has been around since 1995 and we have always looked into hot thermal processes, which is, for example, cement making, but also steel making, power and other industries. So let me give you first a brief introduction of who we are and what we do. I founded the company myself in 1995. I was involved with the development of most of the technology that we have brought to the market. And of course, I've also been involved with the project and with helping clients to optimize their plant. We are specifically located in a small village called Barleben, which is not too far away from Magdeburg, Germany. And our main markets are power markets, especially power market for solid fuels. That could be coal-fired stations, it could be biomass-fired stations, etc. Then cement making with all its solid flows and gas flows, waste to energy, but also, of course, smelter industries. And the smelter industries would be anything in refining, copper, uh, so all the non-ferrous, copper, zinc, uh, but also um, the um, steel industry itself, so measurement of uh, furnaces, hot gas, up to two and a half thousand degrees Celsius. So basically, what we are specialized in is measuring hot and dusty flows. This is really the specialty of our company. This is where we are probably the most specialized company in the industry. And our products, of course, help uh, to increase the availability of your plants, save energy, have better process control, 
Yeah, if you if you look at process noise, if you look at swinging fans, if you look at um, combustion processes that are out of stoichiometry, um, if you're looking at lowering NOx emissions, or you would like to have a better stoichiometric control and O2 control on your furnace outlet or inlet. These are typical applications where Promicon comes into play with gas flow measurement and of course also with consulting clients of how they can best use our technology to optimize their process. Throughout our company's life, we've done a lot of projects. Uh, you can see here just an excerpt. These are mainly, uh, these are just cement projects that we've been doing. We have many more projects in power and steel and refining but we have been doing projects basically all over the world and in all economies. Now, today I'm going to talk about digital gas flow measurement. It sounds not very um, fancy digital gas flow measurement, but it's a big, it's a big thing. Um, how is gas flow measured these days? Uh, still like in the old days, mainly by creating an obstruction in a plant, in a, in a pipe or in a duct and measuring the delta P, basically following the Bernoulli equation. This is what we call an analog measurement. It gives you a delta pressure, which you then can calculate into a flow. Now, the drawback of this technology is very obvious in, in many applications that have dust contamination. In cement, it's so clear that no cement plant really has a delta pressure measurement in its main process locations. You, you don't find delta pressure on downcomers or on tertiary air ducts or on raw mills. Um, you can see on the lower right hand picture, this is a very nice example of a sensor of Promicon that we have pulled out of um, a bypass duct. And you can see all the dust settling on the antenna. So we have to be able to measure this without any impact of the dust to our measurement. And this is basically a, a huge task for all analog instruments such as delta pressure, but also other analog instruments such as um, thermal dispersion or such as measuring speed of sound, ultrasonic measurements. Um, all these measurements have the disadvantage that um, the impact of dust and also of the heat, because that dilutes the gas to very thin density, all have an impact on the measurement. What we do is radically different. We have invented this system in the 90s, and it has been very successful throughout many industries with a lot of dust in um, the gas flow. And the main trick is basically that we do not see the dust as an obstruction or a problem to our measurement but we really use it as a tracer. We are actually measuring the dust velocity flowing by our sensors. So the dust as it is carried by the gas um, is basically indicating the velocity of the gas flow. And this works extremely well. And the way this works, I would like to briefly explain to you so you have an idea of how our measurement is uh, working in principle. What you can see here is two sensors in a duct. The duct is full of gas and dust. Dust levels may be mm, 50 grams per cubic meter, one gram per cubic meter, 50 micrograms. You know, we have a very, very wide range of dust that is allowable for our measurement. And as this dust flows by our antenna, it leaves a small electrostatic charge on the antenna. And as the dust density is slightly fluctuating, this fluctuation then shows also on the antenna in what we call a time signature. So as the dust is flying by the antenna, you can see uh, slight variations in electricity or in electric field. You can see that sig signal uh, of sensor one, which is the black signal, and the signal of sensor two, which is the red one. Now, you can see with your bare eyes that these signals obviously are very similar because at the distance of our sensor, which is usually like 300 millimeters, at that distance, the flow pattern and hence the time signature does not change much. It remains very similar. 
But since these sensors are mounted in the flow direction offset, you will also see that the time signature arrives at different times on each sensor, right? So sensor one is earlier than sensor number two, which is not very hard to understand. Now, what do we do with this? What we do with this is that we put this signal, which is an analog signal, we digitize it, and then we put it into a digital signal processor in order to find the time shift of these two signals. And the way you find the time shift is simply that you take the two signals, you multiply them, or mathematically we call it a convolution, you convolute the two signals to see their overlap. And then you time shift them and you do the same thing again. So time shift, overlap, time shift, overlap. That's what we call cross correlation function. And this cross correlation function basically then allows you to calculate the time shift between the two functions. So you have the two time signatures, you uh, calculate the cross correlation by a signal processor, and out comes the cross correlation function. The cross correlation function itself, again, has a lot of noise components left and right. And in the middle, just right beside the zero point, you can see a sharp maximum. And that maximum, that is exactly the point in time at which both sensor signals have the maximum overlap. And that's it. We are looking for a statistical match between those two um, time signatures. And the time shift is then basically what we measure. Our system is a time shift measuring machine. Now, the, the sensors are mounted at a certain distance. I mentioned 300 millimeters, right? So we know in the time shift that we measure, the gas must have traveled 300 millimeters. So all we do is we divide 300 millimeters by the time shift, and that is meters per second. That's velocity. So that's already it. And the beauty of this uh, measurement principle simply is that we have a direct velocity measurement by measuring the time shift. And that velocity measurement is only depending upon the distance of the sensor and time. So no analog distortion of our signals, no um, amplification or no um, dampening of our signals because of dust or anything else will have an impact on our measurement because we are not interested in the amplitude of the signal. We're not interested in the frequency of the signal. We're only interested in the time shift between the two signals, A and B. And this time shift is completely independent of how much dust it sits on the sensors. So if you get this nice correlation function with a sharp peak, you know that you have a right measurement and you know that your measurement is accurate. And that is really the beauty of digital measurement. So the digital measurement allows you to get an accurate reading uh, at any time over the lifetime of this whole system, right? So you, you buy the system, you put it in, and after eight years, nine years, 10 years, you make a comparative measurement and you will find the system hasn't changed a bit. It's the same accuracy. You have not, you don't have to recalibrate, to re-zero, to re-span, anything of that is out the window. The only thing you have to do is let it run and get your measurement. How do you install this? The installation is fairly simple. You have um, two mounting lugs that you have to weld on to the duct where you want to go. Of course, you have to create an opening by burning in a hole or drilling a hole. And then you simply put those two sensors in. Our mounting lugs usually are connected by a bar that has the right spacing, in this case, 350 millimeters. And this bar, is also ensuring that not only this, the, the spacing is correct, but it also ensures that the two sensors are aligned parallel, right? 
can see that in the left-hand schematic at the bottom with this uh, green uh, swoosh. That is the right alignment. On the right-hand side, you can see those sensors are aligned a little bit twisted, and that will lead to the fact that the antenna distance is not constant over the antenna length, and that will induce a linear error. So all you have to do is mount the sensors correctly using our um, mounting lugs that have this spacer bar. And then you automatically have an accurate and a repeatable system, which will not lose accuracy over its lifetime. Very important. Another thing I would like to mention before I go on with the configuration, um, you can see here the sensors on the left-hand side, they protrude into the pipe and they are parallel to each other. Now, if you look at this picture on the, on the left-hand side, you can see these light grayish arrows which symbolize the, the flow of the gas. Um, what I would like to mention, which I think is a very important feature of our measurement as well, it's not only digital. Our measurement is also a vector measurement. What is a vector measurement? Well, the vector measurement means we are measuring a we are measuring two values. One is time, and time is is undoubtedly a scalar value. It has no direction. But the second one is distance. And distance is not a scalar value. Distance is a vector because distance points somewhere. Now, where's our distance here? Our distance is pretty much what these grayish arrows are showing. The distance between the two sensors, and that is the vector, which is perpendicular or orthogonal on our two sensors. And that is very important. If your flow has a light swirl, or it has a light, um, um, a light uh, lateral component, our measurement will only measure the velocity in the direction of the axis of your duct. Very important. And we've proven this in many applications, and that's one of, of the great features. You don't need to have a honeycomb or some other devices to uh, straighten out your flow. You can go straight into a swirled flow and you will measure the correct vector that goes along the duct. So these two features, digital measurement as well as vectorial or vector measurement, are the key cornerstones to our success in the cement industry. So let's go on for uh, the real measurement here. You have this measurement box. This is a small box with the electronics. You mount it somewhere on the on a rail close in the vicinity of your measurement. And then you have the cable to the sensors. The box usually takes in 24 volt DC. Um, we also can supply a, a power supply, but we prefer this 24 volt DC. And then out comes a 4 to 20 milliamp signal with system fault indications uh, to your plant. And that's pretty much it. There is another version of this uh, system which uses what we call a range extender. I will only briefly talk about this because for cement clients, range extenders are usually not that necessary. A range extender was um, invented by Promicon for any case where you do not have enough dust. So if you are measuring clean air, for example, in a batch process in the steel industry or in a power plant, then there's not enough dust uh, so that we that there's no signature on our sensors one and two. In this case, we have invented the range extender, which ionizes the gas. And this ionization is done in a certain time pattern, in a non-periodical time pattern. So we give a ionized signature onto the gas. And then you can also measure the gas when it's clean. So the system with a range extender allows measurement of clean or dusty gas in any case. I would say 90, 90, 95% of our measurements in the cement industry do not have a range extender because they are mounted in locations where you always have more than enough dust. All right, so this is exactly what we can deliver to you. A temperature range up to 1000 degrees Celsius, a velocity range three to 100 meters a second three to 100 meters a second, it's no joke. There's a huge turndown ratio that we can serve. 
why is 100 meters per second interesting? Sometimes you have, uh, for example, a tertiary air duct with a, a refractory lined venturi or some other form of um, shallow section. And in these sections, you can get fairly high velocities. The point is that Promicon measurement is completely linear. So we don't have any turn down and span problems uh, like other measurement uh, systems have. Dust concentration range, as I mentioned, zero milligrams up to 3000 grams, you read right. Yeah, we can, we can take in several kilograms per cubic meter as a load, as a maximum load. Um, typical accuracy, uh, plus minus 2%, that depends a little bit, of course, on the uh, on the ducting, on the routing of the duct, but we can advise on that. Repeatability, best in the world, I, I'm, I'm proud to say. Um, we have done recently a certification for a measurement on a stack, and the Deutsche TÜV told us this is the most repeatable instrument we have ever tested. And then uh, update time, one second, smaller than that, um, IOs, 420, protection, IP66, NEMA4, and for power stations, uh, this is even available as an SIL2 version uh, for boiler safety. But that's usually not uh, requested in cement plants. But these are the main features. Just one thing I would like to mention. I mentioned here up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. Promicon also has measurement for the steel industry that go higher than that. They go up to 2,500 degrees Celsius. They are optical systems. And just as one teaser for you as an audience, Promicon will come to market with this technology also for the cement industry to measure very special uh, processes um, at temperatures that might even be much higher than 1,000 degree Celsius. Okay, what is the main important uh, feature here that you have to remember? No K factors necessary. It's not like a Venturi where you have a special K factor. No calibration, no drift. The only duct modification is mounting lugs that you weld on from the outside and no regular cleaning or maintenance. So in the second part of my presentation, I would like to show you a little bit on what to do with it and where to go. Um, in a cement plant, there are dozens, if not hundreds of possibilities where to measure gas flow. I would like to present, since we have hundreds of clients around the world and many, many hundreds of installations, I would like to mention the most popular ones um, that are to be found in the cement industry. Starting from the left, vertical roller mill, raw mill. Raw mill is usually a very, very popular uh, application in order to save energy on the mill. Um, in the middle, bypass control, also very important. Uh, it depends a little bit on the gas composition, especially if you have chlorine issues or other issues. People like to measure the bypass and to see how much gas is left through the precalciner and the riser. And then in the middle, downcomer. That is the most popular measurement that we have. Downcomer means we have um, the main flow that comes out of your um, uh, out of your uh, rotary kiln and it allows you to control your ID fan uh, on behind the behind the uh, kiln preheater. I will talk about that as well. And then a uh, clinker cooler. Um, in a clinker cooler you do have sometimes measurements into the clinker cooler but you have no idea on what goes out of the clinker cooler. So you don't know what kind of TAD you have, what kind of waste heat recovery. So measuring around the clinker cooler allows you to create a mass energy balance over this very critical component. Then we have tertiary air measurement. This is one of our most important measurements when it comes to NOx control, when it comes to a better control of your pre-calciner. And tertiary air measurement is very, very demanding. And I think we're the only company that really has a good install base of TADs and we will also come up with more innovations in the TAD. We think TAD is a very, very pivotal area to optimize your pyro string. And then last but not least, waste heat recovery control. That's where you can measure, again, enthalpy flow into um, heat exchangers and waste heat recovery systems. So let's look at some of these processes and what you can do with it. 
Um, all the numbers that I'm going to present now are, I would say, um, rough estimates on what we have achieved. These numbers might not be exactly the same in your process because your plant is different, your capacity is different, but also the margin that you can optimize might be different. So it really depends on the margins that you uh, control. Before I start into that, I would like to use a few seconds to talk about gas flow in cement plants. If you look at how much electric energy your cement plant consumes, you will find that um, a great portion of that, about 50%, is only used to move gas around. So moving gas around is a huge energy consumption. So managing gas flow itself and managing the ID fans and the blowers that are used to, for that itself is already a very profitable target. In modern cement plants, you have fans that have capacities of up to one megawatt. These are not small machines and these are cost factors. So it's not only saving fuel, it's not only optimizing process noise, it's simply also optimizing fan power consumption and managing gas flow to the optimum uh, and avoiding um, overblowing. And this is a very typical example here. A raw mill, again, is a very, very big machine that uses a certain amount of gas flow to operate correctly. The gas flow enters the mill at the bottom. It's blowing up the vertical roller mill in order to um, get the raw mill off the roller table. And then, as you know, you have uh, a cycle, the, the raw mill uh, can go up to the classifier and if it does not pass the classifier then it falls back onto the roller table and is ground again and if it passes the classifier it then goes out and is stored or is basically filtered by a bag house and then stored. Now the problem is always the same. You have a raw mill and that raw mill has a certain um, flow rate that you need to maintain in order to operate the raw mill correctly. And this flow rate is a little bit one-sided because if you have a higher flow rate, what happens with your mill is that you may get a little bit different particle sizing. However, this can be controlled quite well by a dynamic classifier. Um, the other thing that can happen when you go to the low end of your airflow, um, the consequence will be that your roller table will fill up with more and more raw meal. So the mill starts to drown and in the worst possible scenario, your mill can trip. So the operators are usually using a security factor of let's say 10, 15% to overdraft the mill. Now this keeps the mill happy, but it uses a huge amount of fan power. And when I say huge amount of fan power, most modern plants have frequency controlled fans and the frequency controlled fan uh, responds to the third order on changes in flow with power. So if you increase your flow, your needed electricity will change by the third order. So let's say a 10% increase in flow will easily result in 26, 27% in electric power increase. So this is very important. You want to keep um, you want to keep your flow at the at the rating that you really want to want to be at, right? So you don't want to overdraft your mill, and this allows a huge savings potential on the air amount. If you don't overdraft your mill by 15%, but only keep let's say five six percent over the the minimum, you will save 10% of air, and the electricity savings will be very large. Electricity savings here, as uh, by typical um, uh, raw mill size, today raw mills will be actually be bigger than that, but it's really not a long time, in this case 1,500 hours, until you have um, gained back the investment on one system. Raw mill savings are one of the, the big ones when it comes to pure fan power. I would also like to mention another thing while we're here at this nice example. 
many people will you or of you will know what the term process noise means process noise means that your plant is not running flat lined but there's always some up and downs in the fans there's always some up and downs in the flows and if you now think about the non-linearity of your fan power consumption yeah i mentioned an increase in flow goes to the third order into the power consumption and that means if your mill goes up and down and up and down all the up movement has a disproportional high amount of electricity consumption as a consequence so if you have a control system or an expert system in your plant and by a better flow measurement you manage to get your process more flatlined you immediately start to save power on all of your fans right so an accurate measurement and a better control will automatically save power and you can see the magnitude here yeah that's the typical magnitude of power savings all right let's go to the next one the next one is downcomer now downcomer is super super important of course because that flow is really the flow that comes out of your um rotary kiln it is the flow that is also uh, coming out of your precalciner and of course um it is also the flow that goes through the um, kiln preheater. Uh, so the whole um, the whole uh, cyclone um, chain up to the top of the kiln preheater. Now, it's not hard to imagine that during all this process and during all these uh, cyclone uh, stages that you go through, sometimes three, sometimes five, you will have a lot of leakage air coming into. Yeah. So after your kiln, you add more and more leakage air, and only at the very end, when the gas temperature has come down again, um, and it comes down at the downcomer, it finally ends up in the fan. So the fan has to pull quite a lot of gas. Now the question here is, what is the right flow rate at that fan, and how does it influence the stoichiometry in your kiln? Now, um, there are a lot of systems out in the market to measure the O2 directly. There's, for example, uh, a system from also a German company, Enotech, where they go into the kiln and they have um, a direct O2 measurement on the kiln. A very important measurement in order to run the kiln at the right stoichiometry. However, this is not directly connected to the fan because there's a lot of leakage air coming into the fan. And from our measurement, we can see that the gas flow through the kiln is fluctuating quite a bit. Even if you use O2 measurements on the downcomer, it is very difficult because on the downcomer, the O2 value is much, much higher than on the kiln inlet. You have added much more air and using an O2 value on the downcomer to control the fan is also difficult. So here's what many of our clients do. They buy a system from Promicon and put it in the downcomer. And by that, they have a direct flow value to the fan. And in addition, of course, they are using their O2 measurement that they, are, for example, have on the kiln inlet. And then they build a cascaded controller that uses the O2 value for the long-term control and that uses the Promicon measurement for the short-term fan control in order to lower the process noise and optimize fan operation and we can see this here a little bit better the oxygen value measured in the gas analyzer at the gooseneck uh, of the preheated tower it's usually a fairly difficult way to control the heater in the short term as as mentioned yeah so the solution would be to have a cascaded controller with a real flow value as well as with the O2 value for the long-term um, target of O2 on the kiln inlet or on the gooseneck. And here again, a little bit of an example. Um, these numbers are not 100% accurate, but the order of magnitude is correct. This is the savings that you could expect, for example, on the 3,000 tons per day kiln. So, um, Considering the coal price, all the values are here. Um, 
you can see the savings also in fuel. This is not only now savings in fan power. You are talking also now savings in fuel by a better control of your stoichiometry in the kiln. Again here, return on investment about one month. It is not relevant whether this is one month or whether it's 1.5 months, right? For CapEx, you look at one year, 1.5, two years, for the measurements that we put into neuralgic points of your plant, you can expect much faster returns. And we see from clients such as uh, Lafarge Holzim, wherever they put up new plants, be it in Europe, be it in Asia, be it in Africa, in all these plants, they put in our measurement because they want to be sure that they have the right measurement at the right neuralgic points. Okay, next one would be bypass. The bypass uh, is not always uh, a big um, target, but when it is, it is very important. Uh, it depends on how much gas the, the client needs to bypass, of course, and it, he needs to be sure that the, the bypass um, amount is um, not too big. So, uh, you know, the point here is maximizing the waste heat of the clinker cooler. Um, and if you have too much bypass or the bypass amount is not correct, again, it's a big energy loss. Um, here we have an estimate of one kilowatt hour per ton of grinding material. So basically, um, it is also an energy saving tool. We have the impression that for most of the client, the bypass is more than that. It also has to do with better control of product quality because the wrong amount of bypass can also impact product quality. Now this bypass is so critical that a German plant wanted to have a very exact knowledge of the accuracy of our system. And what you can see here are members of the VDZ, Verein Deutscher Zementwerke. That's the German word for Association of German Cement Makers. And the cement um, association has a testing team and they took a very detailed grid measurement in this um, uh, bypass in order to compare it with our measurement. And the result was very, very good. We had a very low uh, deviation to their measurement. And since then, the measurement has never drifted away because it's a digital measurement. You have an accurate flow on this location at all times over the life of the system. Now, a few more. I mentioned tertiary air duct. Tertiary air duct is, I would say, one of the most interesting applications. You have a thousand degree or sometimes 1100 degree hot gas flowing. And the tertiary air is the main oxygen source that goes into the precalciner. The tertiary air duct also is the bypass for the secondary air of the rotary kiln. So tertiary air duct has intimately to do with NOx formation of the cement plant. You have a certain amount of fuel that you throw into your, or you inject into your precalciner. And um, then of course you have the hot gas coming from the rotary kiln. But the hot gas from the rotary kiln does not carry much oxygen. It's just 2%. Whereas the tertiary air duct, which is basically just heated up uh, air from the, from, the, um, from the clinker cooler, this carries a lot of oxygen and it controls the formation of thermal NOx in the cement plant. And I know in many countries, such as India, primary NOx is a big concern and it's uh, very much um, uh, monitored by the, um, the environmental um, agencies. So you want to know how much tertiary air do I put in? Promicon have a measurement at that location with high temperature sensors. Um, and this measurement has been installed in many plants around the world, and it's a very critical measurement to optimize the process. As I mentioned, Promicon also planned to go to higher temperatures, so this would also affect certainly future applications of tertiary air duct. We see a very high focus in our new development also for tertiary air duct, including temperature and including other features of the flow. So next year, I will probably have a webinar where we can present some nice technology also for this application. But for now, you can do what many people have done by a tertiary air duct measurement in order to allow you 
to measure the flow into your pre-cal sign. And again, here, controlling the hot gas flow uh, into the pre-cal signer, optimal energy distribution, but also optimal temperature distribution, which allows you to have a much better control of the NOx. Okay, here a couple of um, a couple of results. It's not so interesting now to save fan power. This is not a, a big a big target for tertiary adduct. For tertiary adduct, it's much more how much NOx formation do I have? And also, do I have any problems in my riser duct? Do I have any uh, ammonia bisulfate um, or anything that's baking on the sides because the temperature windows are not correct? And the temperature windows are very much influenced by the flows also coming from the TAD. Very, very important measurement point. Okay, now, as I mentioned before, um, we are able to measure all the off-gas uh, ducts from the clinker cooler, and by that, we are able to set up a mass energy balance in the clinker cooler. Why is this so important? Why is it so important to know the balance of flow from the clinker cooler? Well, as you know, there are several ID fans on both sides of the clinker cooler. If we, if we take this picture, to the left side, you have the rotary kiln, and basically uh, behind the um, preheated tower, you have this big ID fan, which is the big pulling factor on the left-hand side of the clinker cooler. Now, you also have ID fans on the waste heat recovery side, which is the right-hand side of the clinker cooler. For example, a big ID fan on that stack on the far right of the picture. So, you are having two fans pulling in two directions. That means there must be a neutral point in the middle of the clinker cooler. And this neutral point, of course, is important for the operation. And you would like to understand how it goes back and forth. So, the balance of the air that you push into the clinker cooler versus the balance that you pull out of it and where you pull it out is important to understand. So measurements on the off-gas side of the clinker cooler are important. And again here, um, deviation of spe specific flow causes um, more uh, air particles to be carried over. Also, the balance of the kiln combustion air can be optimized by having a better idea of your mass energy balance on the clinker cooler. Again, what, do you, what, what can you regulate? Well, it, again, it's another measurement of how to optimize the balance of your ID fans. I know that fans that are so remote and so far away from the clinker cooler, of course, need clever controls. I know that you have in your plants a lot of control systems that optimize the overall control of the gas flow. These systems, uh, if they get a better input of the, uh, of the gas flows through the clinker cooler, they can work much better and help to optimize your process. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is waste heat recovery. Waste heat recovery became more and more important in recent years because there's more eye on the, the wasted energy of a cement plant. As you know, cement making is the most energy intensive process of all of these processes even more energy intensive than, um, than uh, making steel and certainly more CO2 in, 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 in intensive. So you would like to uh, re recoup some of these um, losses by the waste heat recovery measurement into the boilers. And Promicon have done quite a few measurements in that. Some of them for cement, maker, cement makers or cement plants, some of them also for manufacturers of waste, waste heat recovery boilers themselves. So they wanted to know how much enthalpy is carried into my boiler via the gas, and then they would measure in the boiler the steam parameters to see how much the recovery rate was, and by that they could calculate the cleanliness of the heat exchanger and its performance. So by an online um, balance and efficiency calculation, you can get a much better understanding of your um, heat recovery systems and your heat exchanger. 
Here's an example typically of a heat exchange that we have done, uh, waste heat recovery of an AQC boiler. Um, again, a very difficult measurement location, uh, very short uh, and, and a bend, very close to our measurement, but very successful installation. We've had two pairs of sensors in order to have a better average. And then the whole thing was measured into the weight heat recovery boiler and another very interesting and successful application until today. So these are the main, the main applications that we have. Um, I have not one here on my, um, on my slides, which I would still like to mention to you, and that's finished product mill. All of your plants have a finished product mill where you grind your cement. Needless to say that for these mills, the same rule applies as for the raw mill. These finished product mills are sometimes uh, tube mills. Many, most of them are tube mills. I've heard that some big mill manufacturers also make finished product mills now as, as roller mills, but most of them are tube mills, like the typical Pfeiffer or whatever they're called. And uh, these mills, of course, need a good airflow management in order to be able to, to, to get the right amount of material out of the mill and in order to keep the right balance in the mill so that again, there's not too much uh, clinker falling into the mill and uh, or not too much fine cement taken out. So here again, we, we measure the direct flow out of the mill. We measure the direct flow into the mill as well as any uh, recirculated gas flows. So I've talked about pyro string. I've talked about clinker cooler. I've talked about milling section, raw mill section, uh, finished product mill section. All these measurements have the same problem. The dust content of the gas does not allow to have a good gas flow measurement. Promicon has resolved the system, which you can see in, our, in, in many of our installations around the world, hundreds and hundreds of installations. And customers that keep on ordering, we have customers that do one after another. And the long-term performance of our digital measurement has convinced all of our clients very, very well. So you can look into our reference lists. If you want to see reference lists, please let us know. We're going to show you clients up and down. And the big advantage here, we do not have the problem of delta pressure measurement, but also we do not have the problem of any other measurements. You know, like uh, hot wire anemometer, which will also be affected by dust over long term, or ultrasonic, which is difficult if you have a gas which is a thousand degrees Celsius hot and which is so thin that the, 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 the sonic velocity gets very, very low. Also, uh, any sort of um, acoustic measurement will suffer from the very high amount of dust in the gas. All this is not uh, the problem with, with our measurement system. So the two main features to keep in mind, we have a vector measurement, so we can work in very big pipes. We have a digital measurement that is not drifting at all. And our measurement has been proven for very, very dusty and very, very rough environments. That's basically been the whole life of our company and our product cycles. We are the measurement company for hot and dusty gas flows. And that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for giving me your time and I will be very happy to take any questions. And should you have more questions than I can answer, please be sure we will uh, answer your questions via email. So I hope I can take a few and, and the ones that I cannot take, we will get back to you. Don't hesitate to contact us at info at promicon.com or you can write a mail to me. We'll be happy to get in contact with you. Thank you. Okay, Hans, uh, thank you for an excellent and very comprehensive presentation there. Um, as you pointed out, it is now time for our live Q&A session. And as I mentioned earlier, for you guys in the audience, this is a great opportunity to get your questions uh, answered by our sort of captive technical expert here today. Um, so just to remind everyone, submitting a question really is very easy. Uh, for those of you using a desktop or laptop, please look to the top right of your screen 
click on the question mark icon and then type your question in the box that comes out and then just hit send. And it's very similar on a mobile or cell phone. Uh, again, top right of your screen, you'll see an icon with a question mark. This will take you to the chat tab, then please select the questions tab, type your question in and then press send. Um, as Hans mentioned, um, we'll go through as many questions as we can in the time we have available, but please do not worry as if we don't cover yours live, uh, all questions will still be passed on to the team at Promicon and they'll be able to get back to you in due course. So without further ado, let's get into some of these questions. So to start off with Hans, um, can you tell me what are the sort of potential savings in terms of electricity usage when it comes to measuring airflow uh, on fans in a cement plant? Yeah, uh, I've, I've covered that roughly. Um, of course, in detail, you would have to go to look up your fan, um, the, your, your fan details. Um, we usually go to the biggest fans first. So you have big ID fans. Let's say you have half a megawatt and you have a frequency controlled fan. Then um, if you can lower your flow by a certain percentage, the savings will be the third order uh, of that. So let's say you can save... Uh, you can lower your average flow by 10%, you have fan savings of way over 20%. If you don't have a frequency controlled fan, uh, then it doesn't go with the third order of magnitude, it goes only with the second order. But still, that gives you 18, 19% of saving. So um, that's pretty much, you know, if you have an annual uh, electricity bill of your fan, uh, take maybe 15 to 25% off of that. That's the potential saving that you can have on one fan. And if you add it all up, it's a huge saving. Okay, excellent. So we've had a question coming from uh, Mohammed here in the audience who's asked, um, in terms of installation, is, the, is a single sensor installation enough for measuring velocity or is two sensors mandatory for that? It's always two sensors because the measurement is uh, functioning via a comparison. We are comparing. We are comparing sensor one and sensor two. And only by this comparison, we can detect the time gap between the two signals. And this time gap is basically our measurement. That's the time of flight. And the two sensor distance and the time of flight allow us to calculate velocity. Right now, and what do you do with velocity? Of course, you take the temperature of the gas, you take the barometric pressure, and then out of this, you can calculate a standardized gas flow, right? So that's, and of course, you need to, you need the cross-sectional area of your, of your duct. So you have, you have a cross-sectional area by at times velocity gives you volumetric actual flow. And if you then uh, compensate with barometric pressure and you compensate with temperature, you get the real flow. So two sensors are always needed in order to sense the time gap between sensor one and sensor two. Okay, excellent. Um, we've had another question come in from Justin who actually uh, begins his question by saying, thank you for the excellent presentation. So that's nice. <laughs> um, the, sen the, the question itself uh, is, is the sensor reading negatively affected by large slip velocities between dust and gas? Is a correction factor applied to compensate for this when determining gas flow? Well, first of all, for the compliment, uh, thank you. And uh, secondly, a very good question. A uh, very, very good and fundamental question. You always have a slip between gas and dust. Without that slip, the, the, the dust would not be carried by the gas. So the mechanism of transporting it all only works by slip. Now, let's look at the, let's look at the dust. If you have dust in a, in a cement plant, we're talking usually what, what kind of what kind of uh, particle size are we talking? We're talking 20 micron, 30 micron, right? If you take dust of 20 or 30 micron and you let it fall in free air, you will see that the dust settles very, very slowly. So it sinks very slowly. And that sinking velocity, that's basically the, the slip differential. And how big is that in a, in a plant? It would be something like, I don't know, 20 centimeters or 0.2 meters, 0.1 meter per second. And if you have a velocity of 25, 28 meter per second, that's the slip. So I would say the slip is negligible against the velocity. And certainly the slip is not a big variable. Now, I, I need to be a little bit more elaborate on this question because it's really fundamental. You might now say, I have pipes where I have huge 
dunes of material carried through and those are traveling much slower than, than the fines. And that is correct. Now, statistically on our sensors, the fines, the, the small fines, they create 90% of the noise that we measure. So the fines are dominant in their velocity fingerprint. So we only measure the fines and the fines have a very, very small slip against the gas. And that's what we've always seen. So if you compare it with, let's say, a portable delta P measurement that you compare, we are very, very close and it is very sufficient to, to use the dust as a tracer. I hope that answers the question. If you want to go deeper, we have also more measurement data to, to support that. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Ariel here who's asked, um, what is the maintenance required for this kind of equipment uh, in currents with high temperatures, for example, the down camera or the bypass, and you know, currents with high dust concentrations? Okay, uh, high dust concentrations, uh, not significant um, 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 uh, maintenance. Um, I would say high temperatures. We call the downcomers and the bypasses basically the low temperature applications. High temperature for us would be a TAD. In the low temperature, everything up to 600 degrees Celsius. Um, well, we have clients that don't know where their sensors are because they never went out to see them. Um, we really have a client in, in Berlin that we visited at CMX that said, we can't tell you where the, where the sensors are. So our technicians knew from back then, but they, so we've never been out there. So they had the system for about 10 years and they've never been out to, to maintain a sensor. Now let's come back to high temperature. High temperature, TAD. In a TAD, the sensors will burn off over several months. So what you do is in the high temperature, you take them out you cut them off and you weld on a new uh, you know, high temperature steel, and then you just put it back in. Uh, right. So that's, that's the maintenance for very, for, for very high temperatures, but for all the low temperature ones, which are all of the other ones, um, you don't have to expect a regular maintenance for the sensor. Okay, so you, you touched on this a bit in your, your answer just now, but um, following on from that, then are there any limitations in terms of the temperature of the measured gas? And Ariel also had a, a question regarding whether you had um, any applications over a thousand degrees Celsius. Yes, we have applications uh, in the steel industry up to two and a half thousand degrees Celsius. Right. And okay. those applications are not using tactile sensors, they are using infrared sensors. And uh, those sensors will also be available for high temperature applications in the cement industry shortly. So um, if you go way up, 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 to, up, up to a thousand degrees Celsius, we feel quite comfortable with the, with the tactile sensors. If you go 1200, 1600, 1500, we'll have other technology available. Um, and that works very, very well. We have, um, again, we have a lot of uh, nice installed base in the steel industry and the migration to, to cement uh, is, a, is a matter of a few months. So if you have any high temperature application that is way above a thousand degrees you, you would like to measure, please contact us. I think we can work something out. Okay, excellent. Um, and I think for now, one more question on sort of the topic of, of temperatures. Um, Shyam has asked, um, is it possible to make an online heat balance in the kiln system? <laughs> okay, uh, another very good question. I would need to know a little bit more about the kiln. Um, you know, the, 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 the air that goes into the kiln, the so-called secondary air that's coming from the clinker cooler, that cannot be measured in, in any way. Um, so that must be a balance of the, of the air going to the clinker cooler and all the other airs going out. And if you subtract that, the air that's left over would probably be pretty much the air that goes into the kiln. And if you have that, and then you do uh, an, a, a good gas flow measurement on your pre cal signer side, it might be, it, it could be possible. I would need to have a little bit more detail on your plant, please. And we can have, we have process people here to handle these questions. We could let you know. It's a, it's a demanding task. But if you if you manage it, it's a super, super interesting thing because you can then you have a huge optimization potential you can realize once you have understood the mass energy balance over your pyro stream. 
Okay, excellent. So that sounds like a perfect opportunity to discuss something uh, after the, the presentation today. So, uh, Cheyenne, your details will all be passed on to the guys at Promicon and they will be able to get back to you as well on that. Um, now, we've had a question from Luis here who's asked whether uh, 300 millimeters uh, is a small enough distance to think about having a portable device with the two probes in order to measure flow in different places. Is that option possible? Uh, sorry, I did not present it here. We do have a portable system. We also have clients that have so many mounting lug pairs on their plant, let's say five, six pairs, and they have one portable system and they go from point to point to check things up. The answer is yes, we'll be happy to send you more details on the portable system. Okay, excellent. Um, now, talking about dust a bit, are there any limitations um, in the dust loading of the measured gas? Well, the one limitation was mentioned by um, your uh, one of the viewers who asked the question about the slip between the material right. and the and and the, usually that 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 happens when your transport condition go from lean phase to dense phase. Okay. Whenever you have dense phase, you then get a completely slow moving plug or dune of material, and the gas is just De completely decoupled from that. Um, in cement plants, uh, I mean, maybe maybe in some in some storage bins or some transport lines from from silos, you you will have dense phase. But in this whole process, in the thermal process, I don't think you have you have any um, you have any uh, dense phase transport. You you have uh, only lean phase transport, and in lean phase. That's what I uh, mentioned. The lean phase, you that was would be anything up to three, four kilograms per cubic meter of transport gas. And in this case, we would see the fines as the dominant factor, and the fines really are closely tied to the gas velocity. There's only a very little slip. So the so, so the answer is as long as you are lean phase, anything that's say below five kilograms per second, you should be fine. Okay, excellent. Um, and, and continuing sort of the topic of, of dust, um, Adamantios has asked, um, in terms of dust measurement, is calibration ever necessary? And if so, how often? Uh, I mean, we, we don't measure the dust itself, we measure the velocity. Mm -hmm. And the velocity itself is a time measurement, and therefore, that's it. You know, time measurement is the most precise measurement that mankind has ever invented. So you have a, a timing clock and this timing clocks give you a time. And if you have a sensor distance, then you have your velocity. What might be interesting to calibrate for you, of course, is if you have a, a, a bend and you measure right behind the bend. So there is a stratification. So you might need two sensor pairs. You might want to look at the profile and have a compensation factor for that. That is strictly speaking not a calibration of our sensor but that would be a calibration of this application because it's in that region where you can have um, a little bit of a stratified flow which need to be compensated that that would be a calibration but that's once off once you've done that it's it's done okay Excellent. And I think to uh, just one more question to round things off uh, this afternoon. Um, are you able to measure the fuel to air ratio in the calciner? Uh, yes. And it's with a system that we have not spoken about today. We have a system that works on the velocity side, like the one I've shown you. But this system additionally has a microwave measurement device that allows you to measure the concentration of solid in a pipe. And this concentration would be then the solid fuel. It would be the pet coke, or it would be the coal, or it would be the fluff, whatever you have. And this concentration multiplied with the velocity gives you then the solid flow of fuel. So with that system and your tertiary air measurement, you can uh, then calculate the fuel to air ratio in the calciner and that certainly is a big a big um, tool to optimize your thermal NOx formation especially if you have a calciner with two fuel lines one from the left one from the right you want to balance that correctly also you want to have the right flows over time you don't want to have um, a big fluctuation in your TAD 
you know, if you have that, then you then at times you will be over stoichiometric and other times you'll be under stoichiometric. So this is a very good um, way of, of, of checking that. And again, this and next year, I'm sure Promicon will come up with some more technology, especially on stoichiometry, because stoichiometry is is a very interesting target for us in the cement industry. Okay, well, excellent, Hans. Uh, I think we're going to have to draw things to a close there, but thank you so much for your presentation today and for going through all of those questions with us. Well, thank you very much and oh, to the audience. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure to present this to you and I will be very happy um, for anyone coming back with questions or with other requests. Thank you. Okay, excellent. And of course, I'd also like to thank everyone in our audience for joining us today as well. Please do keep an eye on your email inbox as we'll be following up this webinar with a link to access an on-demand version of today's presentation so you can go back over everything at your leisure and review anything you may have missed or simply want to look at again. And before I leave you, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that we are now just a few weeks away from Envirotech, our first in-person conference and exhibition focused on the decarbonisation of the cement sector, taking place from the 10th to the 13th of March in beautiful Lisbon, Portugal. Envirotech is a great opportunity to network with cement industry experts from around the world and to be part of the decarbonisation discussion. For more details, simply head over to worldcement.com forward slash Envirotech 2024. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. If I don't see you in Lisbon, I'll see you all at the next World Cement webinar. Goodbye for now.